on your handout sheet from Acts 13 and 14, um, I've given you two verses as key verses. One is right near the beginning, and one is near the end of this missionary journey. So look at the first key. So Barnabas and Saul were sent out by the Holy Spirit, and they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. So here's the first key for the missionary journey. Saul and Barnabas were sent out by the Holy Spirit. And that's really what we're going to be talking about today. Sent out by the Holy Spirit. And then, if you go all the way uh, to the end of chapter 14, that's the end of the first missionary journey. And verse 26 says, from there, this is part of verse 26, it's not the whole verse, they sailed back to Antioch, where they had been entrusted to the grace of God for the work they had now completed. There is a lot in those few words, and we'll get to them uh, this morning. And we're going to look at our maps today, so you can see I've got a little Google map icon there. The action is going to begin in Antioch, and it's going to end in Antioch. What a great church. If you will follow all three of Paul's missionary journeys, you'll see that in fact, all three of them begin in Antioch and end in Antioch. We're going to talk about that today. And then they go through all of these, place, these places and names that probably most of us can't pronounce or we can't pronounce correctly. But as I've said before, just pronounce it with confidence and everybody else will say, oh, that's how to pronounce that and you'll be just fine, <laughs> right? So, oh, Andreas, there you go. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Yes. Okay. There we go. Okay. Um, then we go down a little bit further. Look at your time icon. This journey lasts one and a half to two years. It doesn't seem that way. It seems like a really fast journey, but it's one and a half to two years long, around 46 to 48 AD. Um, and then we meet some other people. We're going to really meet John Mark this time. And then I've given you some things to look ahead to. Uh, on, at the bottom as we get to it next week. So, here we go. Now, um, if you want to, you can flip over to the back page and we'll, we'll be following along from there, from the notes as we want to. But since I, do have my, since I do have my correct sermon notes now, thanks so much, Andreas, I appreciate it. Are we back on again? Yes, ma'am. Okay, here we go. So last week we were looking at the Church of Antioch and uh, remember what we called it? What did, what did we call the Antioch Church? It was a church of... What's that British candy? Okay. All sorts. There we go. A church of all sorts. I almost went to Park and Shop and bought some candy, some all sorts, but I know that almost no one likes licorice, um, and I would have had a lot of candy to eat. So it was a church of all sorts. It reflected the multicultural community, uh, the multicultural society of Antioch. So while they're worshiping, uh, in ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've called them. So I just want to remind you, um, there were all sorts of people in this church and the leaders were all sorts of leaders as well. Uh, there were Jews, there were Greeks, there were Romans, there were, uh, there were Africans, there were North Africans, there were those from strongly Jewish background, those that were sort of Greek Jews, there were those that were upper class, Manaean was Jewish, but he had been raised as a foster brother of Herod, the one who took took off the head of uh, who took off the head of John the Baptist, and so he also would have been older, and so he, there's really a mix of people there. But it was pleasing to the Lord, and they were gathered together, and they were. It says they were worshiping the Lord, and I've always I keep on including ministering to the Lord because that is what the words literally mean. And what, it, what was going on, I don't want to go into all the background, but basically it was a prayer meeting. They were gathered together, um, and the prayer, they may have been singing together, may, they may have been looking at scripture together, they were certainly praying together, and it is in that setting that the Holy Spirit speaks. Brothers and sisters, there is a place, and we talked about this last time, there is a place for private prayer and worship. And there should be in your life. There must be private prayer and worship in your life. Because if, if you only wait till Sunday to say, okay, well there, I'm going to get my fix for the week, you will, fall during, you, know, you will fall during the week. That's not enough. 
It's not enough. So we've got to have on our own. And there are beautiful examples for this in the Bible. And you know these examples. Jesus gave them bread every, every day in the wilderness. Um, and he says, I'm the living bread. So there's a daily, there's a, the, the manna that came. It was every day. So there's the place for private prayer. And some of you may say, I'm really busy. I don't have much time. And what I found is sometimes when we're really busy, we just kind of give up prayer altogether, right? We say, well, I don't have time to pray an hour. These days, few people do, right? How many of you have time to pray an hour? Maybe some of you do. A lot of us don't. And what happens is we just say, well, I can't do that. And so we give up all prayer together. May I challenge you? Start with a few. If you have a heart, if you say, I haven't got time for that, start with a few minutes. And God will help you expand it to more. By the same token, if you are not part of of any corporate time of prayer, then you're missing out also. You need to be part of a corporate time of prayer. Now before you feel guilty and say, I can't come back on Sunday afternoons when there's prayer meeting. I've got my family, I'm this, I'm that. I understand that. We have different schedules. But corporate prayer can also be prayer with your housemates. It can be prayer with workmates. It can be prayer in your small groups. Those of you that are here with families, it can be prayer with your family. I know of some of you who can't get together for prayer meetings in the week and you have called friends on the phone and you've had corporate prayer on the phone. You can do that as well. Let corporate prayer be part of your lives. When we give a place to prayer like this, let me tell you what happens. The Holy Spirit speaks. He does. You want to hear the you you want the Holy Spirit to speak? Give place to prayer. Make an, give an atmosphere of prayer and worship to the Lord. And when we give place an atmosphere of prayer for the Holy Spirit to speak, He will speak. Number one, and number two, we will hear Him. We will hear Him. The Holy Spirit in times of prayer, when we are together with others who are praying, it settles our spirit, it opens our ears, and we will hear Him speak. So I want to encourage you, I want to encourage you to make prayer part of your, your life. So there's this act of unity, they're praying, and the Holy Spirit says, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Okay, so worshiping the Lord means ministering to the Lord, and so God speaks, he gives direction, and it is Paul's first, it's called Paul's first missionary journey, but Barnabas went as well, right? And John Mark went for part of it, okay? But what I want us to see is this this morning. The first great missionary journey, this huge step, does not come out of a planning session. It comes out of a prayer meeting. Our work and our ministry do not come out of planning sessions. Now there may be planning sessions as we go along, but our work and our ministry come out of prayer meetings. They come out of time spent with God. And I think we've gotten the cart before the horse. I really do. We get so busy with planning, right? Because it seems like when we meet together to talk, we can make things happen, right? Now we're doing something. And we plan, now let's do this, 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 and this. And we turn it around. It, the work of God, the ministry of God, the call of God comes out of prayer meetings, not out of planning sessions. And that's true in our lives as well. That's true individually, and that's true for the church as well. And that's in your notes. Uh, and that, that's in your notes. And so the Holy Spirit speaks, and then what happens next? Okay, and so I said our activities, our outreaches, our ministries, our work for the Lord must come out of prayer meetings, not planning sessions. I want to say something else as well to those of you um, who are involved in other types of work as well, but you want to serve the Lord. We sometimes think about work as, okay, here's work for God, now that's spiritual. And here's this other work, and that's not spiritual. That's what God leads, and that's what I lead. That's what I do. I don't think God separates our lives in that way. I think every part of our lives is orchestrated by God, it's planned by God, and so I encourage you and I, I challenge you in your secular work, because most of us in this room are involved in secular work, aren't we? We're, we're doing things that a lot of people would say, well, that's not as unto the Lord or whatever, but it is as unto the Lord. May I say to you that God has as detailed 
and specific a plan for your work outside the walls of the church as he does inside the walls of the church? He really does. He really does. And if you will wait on him and spend time with him, he's going to give you direction about what to do, about choices to make, about where to go, about business decisions that you make. Do I take this contract or not? Do I work with this person or not? Do I hire this person or not? God cares about those things. He cares about those things. And if you will spend time with him, he's going to give you direction about those things. And so we see this, this work of the Lord here. And so we, we read, the Holy Spirit speaks, and then look with me at verse 3. What happens next? Then, after they had fasted, wait a minute, they were already fasting, okay? The Bible says in verse, in verse 1 of chapter 13 that they were worshiping the Lord, they were praying, and they were fasting already. And now, we look at verse 3, and it says, Then after they had fasted, and prayed, and laid hands on them, they sent them off. Why do they fast again, and why do they pray again? The Holy Spirit's already spoken! Mm. Because when we see this type of thing happen, when the Holy Spirit speaks, when there's prophecy, or when there is, when these things happen within the church, it comes through what? It comes through human vessels, right? It comes through you. It comes through me. Are you perfect? No. no. Am I perfect? Obviously not, as you saw this morning. So it comes through imperfect human vessels. So when we feel the Lord is giving a specific direction, this is really practical this morning. I'm sorry if it doesn't feel inspirational to you, but I think I, this, is, this is for us this morning. When we feel that the Lord is giving a specific direction, it is always wise, especially if it's a big step, okay? Especially if it's a big step. It is always wise to confirm it in prayer with others, okay? It's always wise. Now, sometimes we say, yes, but a prophet told me. You know, this says, the Holy Spirit said. Do you know what it means in verse 2 when it says, set apart from me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've called them? Let me give you just a little bit of Greek background. What it means is this, if we, if we were Greek scholars, and we're not, but we have great resources. What this means is the Holy Spirit had already sp spoken to Barnabas and Saul. That's what it means, privately. So it was in their hearts. That's what it means. And then, you know what the Holy Spirit does? Oh, he's so good. Because Barnabas and Saul were part of the church, and they were the leaders of the church. Then, through prophecy, the Holy Spirit gives the direction, I want Barnabas and Saul for a particular work. So he speaks to everyone, but it comes through humans. Holy Spirit, is this really you? It seems like it can't be you, because you know what? Barnabas and Saul are our leaders. Surely you are not saying, tell them to go somewhere and do a different work. Surely they should stay in Antioch. Surely they shouldn't go off somewhere. Surely somebody else should go. We need Barnabas and Saul here. That's what I would think. Isn't that what you would think? If Barnabas and Saul were my pastor, that's what I'd be thinking. And so they pray again, and they fast also. That gives intensity to, pr intensity to prayer. And then what happens? It says, and then they laid hands on them, and they sent them off. Here's this beautiful picture. So through prayer and fasting, the Holy Spirit confirms to them, yes, this is God's leading. This is God's leading. May I say to you, be very, very careful. This is really practical this morning, but I think we need it. Be very careful if some spiritual authority comes to you and says, the Holy Spirit has spoken to me, and you are to fill in the blank. Has somebody ever done that to you before? The Holy Spirit has shown me, you are whatever. What I find in the Bible is this. God almost never works that way. Do you know why God almost never works that way? Because God the Holy Spirit is living in you, right? And since He's living in you, He can speak to you. But He can confirm to other people. Almost the only time God spoke to somebody else with a message for someone was when people were living in sin and rebellion to God. Remember David? living in sin. He'd committed adultery. He had caused murder, all of those things. And Nathan the prophet comes to him and he says, you are the man. And David realized, yes, I am the man. I am the man. 
the Holy Spirit can speak to us. And so they fast and they pray and they send them off. May I, look at this with me, they sent them off. Do you know what this expression means right here? It's a beautiful expression of what this church does for Barnabas and Saul. And I wonder if we could do it. In fact, if you're looking in your notes, in your notes, that's a question I ask us. Would we be willing to do that? Here it says they sent them off. It literally means they released them. It means they set them free. It means they let them go. And this is a beautiful, beautiful picture of a church, a body, working with God and working with members in their body. It really, really is. That's why, brothers and sisters, if you feel that God, if God has called you to a ministry, short term or long term, don't go off secretly. Let us know about it. We will pray with you. We will lay hands on you. We will join you in prayer because it's part of the body. It's part of the body, and it should be that way. And so they send them off, and they trust God that God would provide for them as they remained in Antioch and that God would expand his church beyond Antioch. As I was preparing and reading and doing some studying, I was thinking about the two churches, Antioch and Jerusalem. From Acts 12 onward, the Jerusalem church just fades into the background and the church at the front becomes Antioch. Why is that? Do you know what most Bible scholars believe? Most Bible scholars believe that the church in Jerusalem became more concerned with maintaining their church, keeping everything, the status quo, being provided for, and they began to lose their vision and their missionary outreach. Antioch, however, never lost their missionary outreach and their zeal. And so Antioch moves to the forefront. Now some people might say, oh yeah, but you know, God was doing something different, and that may be as well. But what I want us to see this morning, and we're going to talk about, it, and it's in your notes as well, and what I want to challenge us this morning is this. What type of mindset do we have this morning? Do we have a missions mindset, primarily, or a maintenance mindset? Now you can have both, but usually one will be a priority. As your pastor, as one of your pastors, one of the things I try to do is to be reading and studying things that have to do with church trends and church growth and things like that. In addition to the Bible, I, I spend most of my time in Bible study. I really do, in Bible study and prayer. That's, I want that to be, according to scripture, that should be my number one activity as a pastor. It really should. So that's where, but the other thing I do is I try to study about churches, church growth and things like that. And do you know what I found? Almost all people who study church growth say that when a church hits 20 years old, how old is Lighthouse? 27. When a church hits 20, in their 20s, churches, if they're not careful, begin to lose their outward focus and instead start focusing on themselves. What about us? What about our programs? Well, how much are we spending on missions? But, what, but we need this and we need that. And when that happens, churches will stagnate and begin to die. Sorry to tell you that, but that's what church research shows. Okay, that's not in the Bible. That's what church research shows. But what I want to challenge us in is this. If you had been in Antioch on that prayer meeting, when the Holy Spirit said, give me Barnabas and Saul, I've got a special work for them, what would you have said? Would you have said, no way, Jose, Barnabas and Saul are our pastors. They're our leaders. No, they can't go. What about us? And besides, we're paying their salary. They, they can't go off on a mission trip. How long are you going to go? Two weeks? Eh, okay. A year and a half? No, 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 no. That cannot be. 
would that have been our 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 reaction or would we have reacted in the way that the Antioch church reacted fast pray and acknowledge God this is your leading and so we pray for them and we send them out. And we're part of the mission's work. And I want to challenge you in this area this morning. I want to challenge you. Say, well, this is a little bit uncomfortable, Pastor Jennifer. We don't really like this so much. Listen, this is part of church life. It really is. What, what, what we should be doing as a church is this. We should be praying together. God, what is your plan for us? God, what do you want us to do? As a church, we should be praying. And we should trust God that He can both send us out in missions and He can maintain us here in Lighthouse. The God who is our Good Shepherd can take care of the sheep who stay here in Lighthouse. That's the type of Good Shepherd He is. And that's what we can pray for. And that's what we see. That's what we see. Now what happens to the church in Antioch? We're going to come back to that. But let's look at this. So it says, being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they came to. So I want you to see something here. Verse 3 says, they sent them off. So the church lays hands on them, prays for them. That's what it means, laid hands on them. And they sent them off. And then secondly, what does it say in verse 4? It says, who sends them out? Holy Spirit sends them out. Brothers and sisters, when it's God's work, when it's missions, it is not sent by a church. It's not sent by a church. I want to remind you of those who are our missionaries in the Philippines, all of those that are working from north to the south. Do you know that not one of them came to us and said, pastors, we believe God has called us whatever, and would the church support us while we do this, while we go on this missions trip that God has called us to? Not one of them did that. They answered the call of God, and we saw that it was the call of God, and the Holy Spirit sent them out. Why is this so important? Why is this so important then? And why is it so important now? And why is it so important in your life and my life? Because I don't want you to see this morning, I don't want you to think, well, yeah, but this is missionaries. That's how God works with missionaries. Me, I'm a teacher. Me, I'm a domestic helper. Me, I'm a businessman. God calls each one of us, and God sends out each one of us in various types of work. He does. You think God doesn't care about your life and what you do? Of course He does. He made you as you are. He loves you. He has a plan for your life. And so He calls you and He sends you out. And his, He is part of the work that you do. And so don't separate it with, well, that's for missionaries and full-time workers. And, and me, I just do what I'm doing. I don't believe the Bible supports that. I don't believe that's what we see. So it says they were sent out by the Holy Spirit. Why is this so important? Why is it so important? It's important because, let me, let me talk about Barnabas and Saul first. It's important because as Barnabas and Saul go out, they're going to meet a sorcerer who opposes them. If you're going to meet a sorcerer, now that's demonic stuff, folks. That's demonic stuff, is it not? If you're going to meet a sorcerer, you better know that you're sent out by the Holy Spirit. Yes? Yes. yes. They're going to meet a man who's lame from birth. They better know they've been sent out by the Holy Spirit and called by the Holy Spirit. Paul is going to be stoned and left for dead. And when he picks himself up off the ground, broken and bloody and bruised after they have rejected the message of good news that Jesus saves, he better know that the Holy Spirit has sent him out. You may not face a sorcerer, but may I say something to you this morning? As you go about your day as a child of God, there are devils out there. I'm not, being, I'm not being dramatic. There are devils out there. The enemy has his work, and the enemy will oppose every child of God. You better know that you're sent out by the Holy Spirit. You're going to meet people with needs so great that you will look and you will think, 
oh God, how can I even help? Like that man that was, that was from birth had been lame. How are you going to be able to face and meet and interact with people who have needs so great, needs that will overwhelm you like a tsunami? You better know that you're called by the Holy Spirit and sent out by the Holy Spirit. You're going to do your best. You're going to share love. You're going to share God. And people are going to despise you, laugh at you, make fun of your faith, and mock you for who you are as a Christian and what you say as a Christian. You've got to know that the Holy Spirit has called you and has sent you out. You've got to. Because if you don't, you won't make it. If I don't, I won't make it. I, I've told you before, I, I, and I just want to remind you, so I don't want to, because I do want to, to keep on going on this this morning. Remember I told you when I first went to China a long time ago in 1986? This was in the early years. Ah, uh, it was hard. And it was in northern China. It was so cold. It was so cold. They turned on the heat once in the morning for two hours, once at night for two hours if they had enough coal in the school. And if they didn't, there wasn't any heat. Sometimes there'd be days without hot water. Sometimes there wouldn't be electricity. And it was just hard. It was hard. And the people I, I was working with, um, they probably thought the same thing about me. They were the most difficult people I'd ever worked with in my life. Ever. And we were all supposed to be Christians working together. Have you ever found that to be true? Don't say yes. <laughs> Don't say yes. But we know it's true sometimes. And I was there two months. And I remember, I, I've told you this before. I said, I want to go home. I was boohooing one afternoon, crying on my bed. I want to go home. I want to go home. It was so hard. And you know what? I could have gone home. I could have gone home, could have bought a ticket and gone home. Do you know what kept me there? It was not my great spirituality, because sometimes our spirituality is not so great, right? The only thing that kept me there was I knew that I knew that I knew God had called me. That's the only thing that kept me there. I knew God had led me to that place. I knew it. I knew it. We'll get to that in just a minute, but there's this beautiful passage. There's this beautiful passage, and I encourage you this morning, and I'm going all over my notes. I, I want you to get this in your hearts. Get the, the, the vision, first of all, that God calls you in whatever area, and that He sends you out. But there's another part of it as well. At the end of chapter 14, at the end of chapter 14, it says, and you can look in your notes because that was the other key passage. It says, what? All that short phrase, let it burn in your heart. They sailed back to Antioch, verse 26, 14, where they had been entrusted to the grace of God. Look at this, for the work they had now completed. For the work they had now completed. So if we run out of time this morning, I want you to get that this morning. I'm not stopping yet, so don't start putting up your notes. Okay. But I want you to get the beginning and the end. Put the two together. God has called us, and God has sent us out. Brothers and sisters, you hang in there until you've completed the work that God has called you. Don't be a John Mark. John Mark got as far as Perga, that's the city, and if we get to it, we'll look at that. And the Bible says, John Mark left them there, and he went back to Jerusalem. He didn't even go back to Antioch. He went all the way back to Jerusalem to his home, mm, where Mama was. Thank God for Mamas, okay? Thank God for Mamas, but he went back, he went running back to Mama, to home, to comfort. Now you say, well, you're being awfully harsh on John Mark. Well, later on we read, not just that he left them, but he deserted them. Oh, what a strong word. What I want to say to us this morning is this. If you know God has called you, if you know God has led you, 
See it through. Go all the way. Some of you this morning, you need to hear this message. You need to hear this message. And let me apply it in many ways. Some of you are in marriage relationships this morning. May I speak strongly? And I don't want to, I, I'm not trying to, to cast a burden on anybody, but you want to give up. Or you're in friendship relationships that are really, really hard, and you just want to give up. It's not worth it. And sometimes relationships are broken because it takes two. I understand that. I understand that. But in so far as it lies and depends on you, don't give up. See it through. See it through. Has God called you to do something, and you're discouraged right now? You're in the middle, and you say, this is too hard? See it through. You keep on going. Go to the end. Go to the end. To the work. They had completed the work to which God had entrusted them. And may I share one other thing with you in case we don't get there? If you look at your page, let this encourage you this morning. What does it say? It says in verse 14, 26, they sailed back to Antioch. Look with me. Where they had been entrusted to to the grace of God for the work they had now completed. You and I cannot do what God has called us to do. We cannot make it without the grace of God. You have been entrusted into the grace of God. That's why this morning as we came to the end of our worship time together and I prayed for us this morning, Lord, we receive your grace. It is the grace of God. You are entrusted to the grace of God. You're not on your own this morning, brothers and sisters. Are you in a difficult work situation? Hang in there. Receive the grace of God. You are in His hands of grace and mercy, and He will see you through. It's not your own strength. Your own strength will not see you through. You can't make it on your own. I can't make it on, on my own. It will take the grace of God, and it's the grace of God at work in your life and the grace of God at work in my life. It, he calls us, He sends us out, He sends us forth, and it is through the grace of God that we will do everything He's called us to do. And then we'll reach the end of it. We'll reach the end of it. Brothers, that's how it is. Are you going through a tough patch this morning? It may be through health. It may be in a relationship. I'm not married and I've never been married, but I've talked with people before and I know sometimes in marriage it can be hard. Open your heart and your hands to the grace of God, to the grace of God and keep on going. Some of you are in work situations, oh, so tough this morning. Open your heart and open your hands to the grace of God. Just receive the grace of God. Receive the grace of God and let Him see you through. Let him see you through. You can do it because God will do it through you and in you. Do, does that help you this morning? I hope so. I hope so. And so here we see this. They're sent out and they're sent out by the Holy Spirit. And then what do they do? They go down to the seaport of Seleucia and they sail for the island of Cyprus. And you say, well, Pastor Jennifer, you were just so inspiring and now it's oh so uninspiring. It's all of these names that uh, are not very inspiring, but it will inspire you. And here's the other part that can, that can help you this morning. I've just talked about the grace of God and His call on your life. And that sounds quite lofty and it sounds quite spiritual. But what I want to tell you is this. The grace of God and the work of the Holy Spirit in your life is also extremely practical. Extremely practical. It really is. May I show you why? Look at this. You say, what inspiring thing is, I see nothing inspiring beyond sent out by the Holy Spirit. That, I like that part. May I encourage you as you look at the practicality of the Holy Spirit. They went down to the seaport of Seleucia. You know why? That was the seaport of Antioch. Very practical. Okay, that's a good place to go. They sailed for the island of Cyprus. Why Cyprus? It was the closest large island, and it's where Barnabas was from. You say, oh, oh, that's right. Acts chapter 4, Barnabas from Cyprus. Well, that makes sense. Barnabas knew the customs. He knew the details. He knew the land. That's a good place to start ministry as they go out into the Gentile world. Barnabas has, the, has inside knowledge of this place. And so they start there. Okay, uh, what else? They go to Jewish synagogues first. They're welcome. 
for now, in Jewish synagogues. John Mark went with them. They needed an assistant, and he starts out as an assistant. He was a younger man. And then they traveled from town to town across the entire island. All of that is practical. And you say, well, that's just common sense. Well, sometimes the Holy Spirit helps us with common sense. Do you think that the Holy Spirit only helps you when you feel spiritual? And then when you feel practical, it's you and not the Holy Spirit? I don't think so. Holy Spirit helps us in every part of our lives. He really does. He really does. God has given you the brain that you use to make good decisions. He really has. And then He helps you when those decisions are tough. I think that's what, I, I think that's what God does. And so, here we go. Here's our map. You say, you say, oh, we're getting to the map? Yeah, we're going to get to the map. All 14 clicks, okay? So, what, what the Holy Spirit put in my heart as I was preparing was to look at it this way. If you are anything like me, I realize my grammar's a little bit off. If you're anything, if you're anything like, like me, um, you get to the place names and you just go, zzz, and you go right across. You never pay any attention, right? And you have no idea where those are. So what the Holy Spirit prompted me yesterday as I was in the middle of my preparation and I redid my notes was this. Look with me very briefly and let's get an overview of chapters 13 and 14 and the next week we'll come back and look at the guts of, uh, you say guts, the, the insides of chapters 13 and 14. Okay, where do they begin? Aha, Antioch over here. See where the star is. So they start there. Where's Jerusalem? All the way down there. Remember we said it's about 300 miles. So they're there in Antioch. And let's, let's look with me. I asked you to read chapters 13 and 14. I don't know if you did or not. I'm not going to, don't have to raise your hands. That's okay. Because I would be discouraged. Because I don't know if anybody did or not. Did anybody? <laughs> I should have listened to the Holy Spirit. He said, don't ask. And I asked anyhow. <laughs> okay as we come to a close in the last few minutes this morning. So they start in Antioch. Where do they go first? Seleucia. Okay. Do you know what I was doing when I was preparing to help myself remember? S-S-P-P-P. Okay. Seleucia. Where do they go next? They take a boat to Salamis. That's how I think it's pronounced. Okay. Salamis is the most important city on Cyprus. Then they go across the island and they go to the other side where? Paphos. Paphos. Oh, so you can say it if you want to. Paphos. That'll help you remember. Okay. What happens in Paphos? The sorcerer. Okay. The sorcerer encounter. Bar Jesus. Elimus. Okay. We'll talk about it next week. Uh, by the way, you know what happens in Paphos? Boom. Saul is no longer called Saul. He uses his Roman name Paul from that point onward. Why? It's a, it's a Roman Greek audience. And he, he's used, Paul has been his name all along. He has Saul and Paul, but he's called Paul. You know what Paul means? Not very spiritual. It means little. So probably Paul was a very short man. <laughs> Truly. That's probably, you say, but it sounds like Saul. So it's Saul Paul? You know, like Jenny Penny or something like that? No. Um, probably he was a very short man, okay? So, Paphos, Paphos, encounter with the sorcerer. And then from there, they go where? Perga. What happens in Perga? John Mark leaves them. Uh, as we find out later, he deserts them, okay? So they go to Perga. And then what happens? They go up to Antioch. Whoa, 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 whoa. It's another Antioch. Okay, Pisidian Antioch. Okay, so it's this area, so it's called Pisidian Antioch. This is Antioch of Syria. This one is Antioch of Pisidia, okay? So, ah, you see? This is why maps are helpful to us, okay? So it's Pisidian Antioch. So for me to remember, I just went S-S-P-P-P. -P -P. Seleucia, Salamis, Paphos, Perga, Pisidian Antioch. I can remember that, okay? So what happens in Pisidian Antioch? Huge crowd. They preach two Sundays, one Sunday and a Sabbath. Second Sabbath, so many people come, almost the whole city. And then there's persecution and they and then things happen there. Okay, where they go from Antioch, then they go to where? 
Iconium, ah, oh, this one's really great. In Iconium, there are all sorts of miracles that take place. And if you're keeping track, as I am, in Iconium, there is a plot against Paul's life. If you're keeping track, that is plot number three. It's plot number three, because the other ones were in earlier. You say, it is? Yeah, you go back and read. You'll see. Okay? So Iconium is plot number three. So they leave Iconium when they find out the plot, and they go to Lystra. Okay? Lystra is where Paul, wonderful things happen. Uh, this is where the man that's lame, he is, he is raised. And they think, oh, it's Zeus and Hermes. That's, they, they think Barnabas and Paul are Zeus and Hermes. And they want to offer sacrifices. And then the, the crowd turns against them and they stone Paul, leave him for dead. That happens in Lystra. They pick him up. I don't know if I'd be picked up or not, but anyhow, they pick him up, and the next day they go to where? Derby. Derby. Okay? They go to Derby. Same thing happens. And then Paul being Paul, Barnabas being Barnabas, because they are led by the Spirit, because they are called out by the Spirit, because they have the confidence of the Holy Spirit in their lives, instead of saying, hey, we're pretty close to Antioch. Let's go on and go back to Antioch and let's take a break because we've worked really hard. And by the way, I was stoned and, and I think I may have a broken bone or something like that. Instead of doing that, do you know what Paul and Barnabas do? Paul says, Barnabas, let's go back and visit the new churches because they've got to have church leaders. Mm. You can only do that if you know you are called by the Holy Spirit and sent out and you have the grace of God and you're going to finish the work of God that he's called you to do. You can do it through tough times. Does that make sense? You can do it through tough times. Okay. And so from Derby they go back to, it's green now because it's return, Lystra and then Iconium and then Antioch and then back down to Perga, all in that area, and then they go to Italia, the coast, and then what do they do? And then they go back to Antioch. That's the, does that make sense? Yeah. That, so you've got this kind of whatever, okay? That should, that should help, that should help us as, as we go to chapters 13 and 14. And so we finish with this this morning in the next minute, okay? So that helps us, that's the overview, and here we go. What do we hold? It's in your notes. What, do we, what are we reminded of? From there they sailed back to Antioch where they had been entrusted to the grace of God. You are entrusted to the grace of God, brothers and sisters, in whatever you do. Are you a domestic helper this morning? You have been entrusted to the grace of God in, your, in the household where you work. Are you a teacher this morning? As you go into those classrooms, you are entrusted into the grace of God. Are you a business person? You are entrusted into the grace of God. Are you a housewife this morning? You're entrusted into the grace of God for the work that God has called you to do, short term or long term. Um, it's not easy to do what we have to do. We're entrusted into the grace of God. Does that make sense to us this morning? I hope so. And so they've been entrusted to the grace of God. This is in your notes. Secondly, and we, we started with it there because I was afraid I wouldn't reach this. We wouldn't get this far, but we've gotten there. They completed the work that they had been given. Brothers and sisters, complete the work. Complete the work. Make it to the end with God's grace. Complete it. Don't give up. Don't give up. They completed the work. What else do we see? Oops. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Sorry. I clicked at the wrong time. They acknowledged that God had done it through them. That, that kept them from being proud and boastful. Has God ever used you for a great thing? And your head starts getting, look what I've done. They said, everything God had done through them. And they acknowledged that it was the work of God. And they acknowledged by going back to the church that the Antioch church was part of their work. The Antioch church was part of their work. Maintenance and mission. They go back to the church. The church is still there. The church is vibrant. The church hasn't shriveled up and died because the two best leaders have gone off on a missions. 
you and I want to hold on to people, right? I want, oh, no, 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 I don't want my Bible teacher to go. No, you can't go, you can't go. Hold on to God more tightly than you hold on to any person. He's the one that will see you through. And the Antioch church held on to God. God took care of them. And Paul and Barnabas came back with the message, this is what happened. God has opened, God has opened um, the door of faith to a new people. They're the apostles. And I won't, I'm going to stop, I'm, I'm not going to go into apostles. Maybe later we'll talk about apostles, but most of the people today that say, I'm an apostle, they're not. These are apostles. <laughs> These are apostles. And they stayed there a long time. Why? Ah, it was a good place to be. God called them. And God sent them out. You and I are in part sitting here this morning because Paul and Barnabas went out on missionary journeys. Did you know that? You are a fruit of Paul this morning. And so am I. I'm so glad the Antioch Church released them, prayed for them, let them go in grace. May we also see that we are part of that. That there are people in the Philippines, that there are people in China, there are people in other places that are the door of grace and the door of the gospel has been opened to them because we have been part of the work of God. Don't give up. You started something good. Go all the way through. Lord, we thank you this morning for your word. We thank you, Lord, for Paul and Barnabas who didn't give up. They were sent out by you, and they were entrusted to your grace. And because of that, they were able to go through stonings and persecutions and, and, and encounters with, with demonic forces, but they were able to make it through because they were entrusted to your grace and they finished the work that you gave them to do. And then they went back again and they were part of the church. Lord, we thank you for this example to us. May we too be found faithful in the same way. May we not give up. May we make it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 God bless.